Coming up on SBU TV, we take a look at how U.S. commandos took down one of the worst villains and take a look back at the Virginia Tech massacre. Hello and welcome to SBU TV. I'm Lauren Adams. And I'm Christy Angieski. The terrorist leader responsible for more than 3,000 American lives has finally been killed. Dave Kokowski of SBU's broadcast reporting class takes a look at a Bonaventure reaction. Oh, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Nearly 10 years after the attack on the World Trade Center, Americans got the news just before midnight Sunday evening. Good evening. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. St. Bonaventure students and people worldwide quickly turned to Twitter to voice their opinion, as nearly 4,000 tweets were sent per second. The news was extra special to St. Bonaventure Jr. Shannon Shepard. Well, at first, I didn't know I was worried if I should feel guilty because someone was dying. Um, but then my mind immediately flashed to my dad, who's, um, he works for the U.S. Navy. He was in the Navy and now he's a civilian. Um, and he currently travels back and forth between the United States and Iraq. The whole reason he's overseas and the whole reason he'd be over there in the first place is because of what happened in 9-11. We didn't think that this war on terror was going to last for 10 years. He would miss, you know, softball games and he'd miss piano recitals because he would always have to commute because to go to the Navy base. As college students today, we have spent nearly half of our lives in the war against terrorism. And the death of Osama bin Laden is a milestone in American history that could bring our troops back home from overseas him passing now it's a little bit gratifying because I feel like something actually got accomplished over there and it feels like all these hours and all these things that he's missed they finally mean something. So I finally got to email him and I said what a great day and he said yep the US Navy does it again. For SBU TV I'm David Kulkowski. There were spontaneous celebrations of Osama's death throughout the West. The war on terror is now one step closer to its long-standing objective of defeating terrorism. But what steps were taken in order to complete this task? Joe Landers explores the recent valiant efforts of the U.S. military in killing Osama bin Laden. Americans flooded the streets with rejoice late Sunday night as news broke that the 9-11 mastermind, Osama bin Laden, has finally been found and killed. But how did a 10-year search for one of the world's most notorious criminals come to a conclusion in just 40 minutes without any U.S. casualties? Let's take a look. Just before dawn, four U.S. military helicopters flew over the compound, located 60 miles outside the Pakistan capital, Islamabad. Bin Laden's guards then began firing at the helicopters, damaging one Black Hawk and forcing it to crash land just outside the compound walls. But that didn't stop the elite Navy SEALs equipped with night vision goggles and M4 carbine rifles from entering the compound. Despite taking heavy AK fire from Bin Laden's bedroom window, the Navy SEALs stormed the building, killing two Al-Qaeda lieutenants. As the surprise raid proceeded, President Obama and his advisors watched live from the Situation Room as Navy SEAL helmet cams provided real-time footage. Once the Navy SEALs reached Bin Laden's bedroom, Bin Laden used a woman as a human shield as a cowardly last-ditch effort. The Navy SEALs shot and killed the woman and then turned fire on Bin Laden, striking him in the chest and the left eye. In about 40 minutes, the most critical task of the mission had been completed. Bin Laden's body was being flown to the USS Carl Vinson aircraft carrier in the North Arabian Sea, and it was aboard this ship where Bin Laden was granted an Islamic burial at sea. For SBU TV, I'm Joe Landers. President Barack Obama encouraged the U.S. to, quote, remember that we can do these things not just because of wealth or power, but because of who we are. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are you wondering who will be heading St. Bonaventure's Journalism School next fall? Well, so are we. Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, Lee Coppola, announced last year he would be stepping down after the 2010-2011 academic year. Now, more than a year later, the Jandoli School is still wondering who his replacement will be. 
Earlier this semester, we reported the university expected to narrow its three final candidates down to one and appoint a new dean by the end of February. But as the semester comes to a close, still no announcements have been made. SVU TV was denied interview requests by the university regarding the subject. Head of the search committee, Pat Vecchio, also declined to comment, but did say, quote, this matter is complicated and nuanced, and I don't think I could adequately portray it in writing, much less in a television interview. SVU TV has learned that one of the two final candidates turned down the position and another is still under consideration, but not likely to be offered the job. The source also said an interim dean will most likely be appointed. The Enrollment Office is finalizing the numbers for the incoming students for the fall of 2011. If the numbers are not met, however, faculty members may have to go without salary increases. the end of the academic year approaching, the Admissions Office is finalizing the enrollment numbers for the fall of 2011. Our, our enrollment goals have not changed throughout the year. University officials said they hope to increase the university's overall enrollment numbers. We would like the freshman number to be above 500, about 525. Uh, but again, it's a matter of reaching an overall of new student enrollment, which is about 625 students. Faculty members may be concerned about the future enrollment numbers. According to a letter sent by the university to faculty members, salary increases for the fall of 2011 are contingent on future enrollment numbers, making meeting those goals that much more important. The university, in general, is a tuition-driven institution, and so the decisions about the budget and the, any kind of ramification about that is dependent upon us achieving multiple components around the tuition. But how is this increase different from past increases? That would compare to 588 new students last year. And what does this mean for the future of SBU? So, we feel all in all very excited about our upcoming fall class. For SBU TV, I'm Connor Mooney. According to university officials, freshman enrollment will not reach 500 students, meaning the university has failed to meet its goal. The noise of bulldozers and backhoes signaled the start of the project that the Bonaventure community has been waiting on for years. Mike Vitron of our broadcast reporting class bounced around to get his story. Students can expect a smoother commute when driving on campus next fall. On April 11th, DNH Excavating started the road work the Bonaventure community has heard so much about for the last two years. Now that the university has secured state funds, Facilities Director Phil Winger explains where the process is at now. We're building these roads, rebuilding them completely, and that means digging down to good soil and, uh, and starting up again. Winger said that although the road behind the Riley Center is in the worst shape, starting construction there would have only interrupted the flow of daily commuting while students were on campus. Crews decided to start at the main entrance instead. Here's what a driver sees through his or her windshield while driving 10 miles below the speed limit behind the Riley Center. The university secured a $1.8 million grant from the state for construction, which the school then matched 25% of. Large potholes, like the one you see to my left, have left students wondering, why would maintenance crews leave the roadways untouched this spring? Well, Winger said, why waste money and time on something that's going to get completely fixed this summer? Kevin Penner's 03 Chevy Cavalier has twice felt the wrath from the unfriendly roads. I got, I went through behind the RC there, and uh, I got one flat tire, and um, I called up maintenance, and they explained the situation to me. Um, so it was going to be done this summer, and then I kind of, I actually got the tire plugged, which was good because I didn't run the tire. And then a month later, I did the same thing, and I, I blew another tire, so I got that plugged again. It, get worse, it seems like it gets worse by the week. It's, it's really kind of a shame. Um, especially for, for tours that, you know, for prospective students that are coming in. Winger said crews expect at least one layer from the road at the entrance finished by commencement. For SBU TV, I'm Mike Vitron. Winger said the roads will be completed when students return at the end of August. Work on the Allegheny River Trail and the Warming Hut will be completed in the fall. The Quick Art Center was originally built to combine the artistic activities of the campus. But is it being used up to its full potential? Megan Sudari reports. Students and extracurricular groups for the Quick Art Center doesn't give them enough access to its resources, especially when booking the theater. 
you need to do it at least a month in advance and then a lot of times there's conflicts so you're trying to rearrange your schedule with theirs and the month in advance comes up really quickly. This problem and others are planned to be fixed soon for students who feel they need more access to space and support to use it. I started meeting with uh, student and faculty groups as well as administrators of various kinds and on the basis of that formulated a series of recommendations. The 14 physical and procedural recommendations are made to enhance students exposure to the arts including creating an arts advisory board, more backstage area, and a theater program space. This impressively documents the university's commitment to make the arts, all of the arts, part of the potential experience of all of our students. That itself is the greatest good that this uh, foresees. One of these recommendations is to make a studio art center in Francis Hall here and renovate these classrooms and offices to a more modern individual art rooms. Dean Nader plans to have all the recommendations finished by 2012. For SBU TV, I'm Megan Sidori. A full list of the 14 recommendations is available on the St. Bonaventure website. Two weeks ago, the St. Bonaventure community lost one of its own. At 9.05 p.m. on Sunday, April 17th, St. Bonaventure University President Sister Margaret Carney sent an email to students and faculty requesting prayers for business school dean Dr. John Watson as he was in grave condition. Watson had suffered a stroke playing golf with friends in Pennsylvania. The following morning, the university released a press release announcing that Watson had passed at 10.15 p.m. Dr. Watson had been a member of the St. Bonaventure family for more than 35 years, serving as dean, provost, and a faculty member. He was also involved in university athletics and well known as the color analyst of men's basketball games on WPIG for the past 10 seasons. Journalism and Mass Communications Dean Lee Coppola will remember Dean Watson for his contributions to the school and university. His legacy will be that he was a solid, sturdy uh, person that the university could rely on and look to for sound advice and performance. A funeral was held for Dr. Watson on Wednesday, April 20th at St. Bonaventure Parish. I'll just remember him as a, uh, a friend. For SBU TV, I'm Shannon Shepard. Watson's wife Suzanne retired last year after serving as a lecturer in the School of Computer Sciences. His son Steve is a university athletic director, and other son John Jr. is a professor of marketing and color, co and color commenter for SBU TV Sports. After the university settlement with the Bagoni family, some prospective students may no longer have a major. Aaron Lowry reports. The community received an email stating the Begoni Center for Aging Studies would discontinue operations as a result of a settlement agreement the university came to with the Begoni Foundation. This decision impacts an entire major of study. The gerontology program is continuing as a minor program for the time being and we're going to just suspend admissions while we consider the future of that program. Gerontology is the study of aging and the aging population. For the 11 students in the gerontology program, they will be allowed to complete their course of study. But for one student, that is proving to be difficult. They're letting us finish it, but a lot of the classes that I need specifically aren't being offered next fall, and they may not even be offered next spring, so that would mean that I would have to stay an extra semester instead of graduating on time. Paul and Irene Bagoni made their first donation to the school in 2003. Later, the couple pledged $1.5 million towards the GRACE project, which led to the creation of the Bagoni Center for Aging Studies. The Bagonis also donated money to fund the Rare Books Library Edition, but when they felt their contract about the donation was broken, the Bagonis took the issue to court. The settlement between the university and the Bagoni Foundation could trigger the decision to end the gerontology program as a major. To suspend admissions, the, the institution has a precedent for suspending admissions, but to put a program on moratorium to discontinue an academic program, um, that, is all, that absolutely requires engagement of faculty and the faculty center. For SBU TV, I'm Erin Lowry. A decision about the gerontology program will likely be reached later this year. What was supposed to be a search for a missing person has turned into the discovery of eight murder victims along the popular beaches of Long Island. Our very own Brittany Wally went back to her hometown for the story. This morning there are fears that a possible serial killer is on the loose and will strike again. Getting some new information here, three more sets of human remains found along the beach. They have found ten bodies so far. 
What began as a straightforward search for Shannon Gilbert, a missing prostitute from New Jersey, has led to a murder mystery. Gilbert was last seen in May 2010 on Oak Beach after visiting a client who responded to her ad on Craigslist. The search for Gilbert began along Ocean Parkway near the remote beach towns of Gilgo Beach and Oak Beach in Suffolk County. Since early December, 10 sets of human remains have been found dumped along the 15 miles of thick underbrush that borders the town of Babylon Beaches, but none of the remains seem to be Gilbert's. Mackenzie Hughes, a resident of Oak Beach for the past three years, feels the mandatory check-in with police upon entering the area is necessary to protect the community. I think that checking in every time you get home is pretty inconvenient, but I like to let the officers do their job, especially since it's for my safety and the people I live near. The four victims discovered in December have been identified as former prostitutes who posted their ads on Craigslist. The four bodies were found wrapped in burlap sacks, leading investigators to believe this was an act of a serial killer. As the search continued in early April, four more bodies were found in another area north of the parkway as well as a skull and human teeth. The state of the condition of the bodies has led investigators to believe they have been hidden for the past two to three years. As summer approaches, the terrain along the parkway will grow thicker and greener, making it more complicated to find any remains that may still linger there. Suffolk County Police Commissioner Richard Dormer told reporters the investigation is still underway. We want to do this before uh, the spring foliage rose in and makes it more difficult. And uh, if there are any more bodies out there, uh, we want to find them. Hughes says this will not affect her beach plans for the summer. I think I'll still be going to Gilgo, but not at night. For SBU TV, I'm Brittany Wally. Police have begun to assess the profile in an effort to narrow their search for the killer or killers and are offering a reward up to $5,000 for information that will help solve the crimes. Last month marked the four-year anniversary of the shooting at Virginia Tech. St. Bonaventure's Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Wolfgang Natter, was a professor at Virginia Tech at the time of the massacre. I sat down with him to talk about how that day affects him still. Wolfgang Natter started his day on April 16, 2007, like he started every day at Virginia Tech. But then something happened that changed everything. This is a day almost every detail remains quite vivid. It hasn't, it hasn't faded in memory. That was the day Song Wee Cho, an undergraduate at Virginia Tech, opened fire on campus, killing 32 students and faculty members and wounding 17 others. The news of the event didn't sink in right away. Both myself and all my colleagues uh, were really in a state of shock, I'd, I'd say, for at least, at least weeks afterwards. Natter stresses that more than just the victims bore the brunt of the tragedy. No one who was on campus that day or who was part of that university community was unaffected. Though the effects of the shooting at Virginia Tech remain with Dr. Natter to this day, what also remains with him is the response other universities had to potential violence following the event. One of the few comforts for those of us who lived through that at Virginia Tech is the knowledge that other universities have learned from that and have sought to institute measures to make sure we're as prepared as possible. He's pleased with St. Bonaventure's efforts to make students aware of and prepared for dangerous situations. We have procedures here. They're good procedures. We have an excellent communication network set up, uh, but that also entails responsibilities of readiness. Dr. Natter's experience at Virginia Tech has him urging everyone in the campus community to take precautionary drills seriously. If and when the unimaginable were to happen, there's no time really to be inventing your protocol. You need to know what to do. You need to know the drill. And uh, that's a responsibility all of us should, should shoulder. For SBU TV, I'm Lauren Adams. Dr. Natter spoke to the Bonaventure community about his experience when the university celebrated a violence prevention week called Enough is Enough early last month. Buying on the cheap is a lifestyle for some college students, but there's more than that involved in one local thrift store's business. Broadcast Reporting's Emily Linder reports. Okay, that's about 
ten dollars. Thrift stores like The Bridge in Allegheny, New York, offer used clothing at a low price. Residents from around the area take advantage of the deals, but recently, shopkeepers have seen an increase in sales from college students. We have some regulars that come week after week. St. Bonaventure student Chris Rady is one such regular. Probably like 80 or 90 percent of my wardrobe is from the thrift store. So. When he was younger, Chris went to thrift stores with his brother to find Halloween costumes, and soon after, it turned into a hobby. But there's only a certain amount of money he'll spend on one item. No more than like two, three bucks. Huh? Thrifting isn't all about the attractive price tag. It's about the cool clothes. I've gotten things from department stores and then I see people wearing them and I'm like, oh, I have that shirt. And like, I'm no different than everybody. But like, if I have like thrift store stuff, it's like, no one else has this, yeah. so. For SBU TV, I'm Emily Lindner. Today's poor economy means thrift stores across the nation are increasing in numbers. The past six months have brought both joy and heartache to the gorilla keepers at the Buffalo Zoo. SVU's Kate Pelzinski of the broadcast reporting class has more. On April 10th, the zoo's 29-year-old female gorilla, Becky, died unexpectedly. She got sick very, very quickly, and then within a week she was gone. Head keeper Cindy Griffin said Becky began to limp, leading the keepers to believe she had simply injured her leg. I thought, okay, she sprained her leg, possibly she broke it, maybe we have a hip on the socket, something that we can fix. Becky was put on antibiotics as a precaution, but when she failed to show signs of improvement, Griffin said the vets decided to re-examine her. By Sunday, she was so ill she couldn't get up. Becky died while under anesthesia. And, you know, of course that was heartbreaking. Griffin says the keepers aren't the only ones feeling the pain. It was especially heartbreaking to watch um, her 10-year-old daughter, who's still here, who was looking for her. This is the first gorilla death since Omega, the dominant male silverback, died about eight years ago. It was really, really hard because you can't explain it to them as much as you want to. The keepers and gorillas are just now starting to find their new normal. The first week was, you know, really, really tough, but, you know, time does heal. While the keepers mourn the loss of Becky, they are thrilled with the newest addition, Baby Amari. So we were very, very lucky last year to get a recommendation for our gorillas, our male Koga and our female Sydney. The gorilla breeding process starts when they are taken off human birth control pills. The pregnancy is closely monitored and usually lasts about eight months. Sydney has turned out to be a fantastic mother. The baby is now six months old and we have yet to have our hands on it. Griffin looks forward to the future of the zoo. We do hope at some point in the not too distant future to have an outdoor exhibit. So they, we could definitely have gorillas out for a good deal of the year. But this is a spot the keepers hope to turn into a future outdoor exhibit for the gorillas. For SBU TV, I'm Kate Pelzinski. The outdoor edition will be open year-round. This will allow the zoo to increase the number of gorillas kept at the Delaware Park location. A local museum that pays tribute to war veterans turns 15 at the end of this month. For a closer look into the World War II Museum in Eldred, Pennsylvania, Jeff Cole from SBU Broadcast Reporting Class reports. The small 800-person borough of Eldred, Pennsylvania is home to one grand museum. The Eldred World War II Museum was founded Memorial Day in 1996 in recognition of the roughly 1,500 men and women who worked in the munitions plant in Eldred during the war. Museum director Jay Tennis said the museum serves as a reminder of the 16 million Americans who fought in World War II. World War II actually represents one of those times when freedom as we know it was under attack. Mr. Tenney said between 4,500 and 5,000 people come to visit the World War II Museum every year. He said they come from all over the United States and all over the world, including places such as Australia, New Zealand, Moscow, China, and Canada. One of the museum's main exhibits pays tribute to Colonel Mitchell Page. Museum curator Steve Appleby said Colonel Page and 33 of his men held off about 3,000 Japanese soldiers during the Battle of Guadalcanal. This is the kind of guy that we want our kids to look up to, not uh, Snoop Dogg or LeBron James. The museum also features a Purple Heart Room, a Holocaust display, a recreated command center and observation post, and part of an actual submarine. Museum admission is $5 per adult and is free to visitors 18 and under. Tennis said about 1,000 World War II veterans pass away each day. He said visiting the museum can be an overwhelming experience for some veterans. It often happens too that that a World War II veteran is, is brought to tears as they go back and they remember some of their buddies that didn't get to come home. For SBU TV, I'm Jeff Cole. The museum is open year-round, Tuesdays through Sundays, except on holidays. Having trouble finding a job? 
LinkedIn is the newest social media website that offers career and networking opportunities. SVU TV's Felicia Woolley of the broadcast reporting class has more. LinkedIn is the newest social media to hit the internet. Unlike Facebook and Twitter, LinkedIn is designed to help companies and future employees connect. St. Bonaventure's Director of Safety and Security, Vito Chez, is LinkedIn and praises the site for its originality. Unlike Facebook, you don't put a lot of pictures and video on here. It's mostly uh, resumes and company information. When you're looking for work, it, it allows you to do a lot of research. When you already have a job, it gives you, it gives you good networking. It's pretty good. It's easy to use. It seems to be the way of the future. It's what all these hiring agencies are using now. Not only are faculty and staff LinkedIn, but so are many St. Bonaventure students. LinkedIn is a website where you know, people can basically create an online resume. That's what I always think of it as when I, you know, do something like complete an internship or whatever, then I'll update it. If you find people who you interviewed with or anything like that, it's a good way to keep them updated as to what you've been doing since you know, were in last year. 936 St. Bonaventure affiliates are currently linked in with more joining every day. With over 100 million professionals using this site, it has become easier for them to reconnect, power their careers, and get answers. For SBU TV, I'm Felicia Woolley. Although users are able to create a profile for free, to utilize all of LinkedIn's features, there's a monthly fee. Coming up in sports, how a new bat design is changing college baseball, and an in-depth look at some of our international SBTV. star athletes. College baseball is less offensive this year, and the bats are to blame. SBU TV's Kevin Clark reports. The familiar <laughs> sound of an aluminum bat has turned into, which is just like wood. This season, the NCAA put new restrictions on the aluminum bats used in college baseball, and the sound isn't the only change. In all honesty. Nobody believed them because uh, they'd done some changes, but nothing significant. The bats were still pretty darn good, and we did make a hell of a jump. We went from bats that uh, had trampoline effect, that the ball's jumping out of the ballpark, to basically wood bats with aluminum bat handles. ESPN Sports Science did a study on the new bats, showing what was a 400-foot home run with the old bats is now a 375-foot fly ball out with the new bats. This difference has changed the way some have coached the game. In the old days, you really questioned yourself about hitting and running, sacrificing, because I'm going to put a straight line up in the next inning, the other guy can hit a three-run homer, and I'm down three to one. So you, you rarely tried to do those things. Recruiting is another area where the new bats may have an impact. If the bats stay the same, for a lot more athletic guy that can do all of the other things like going first to third and play defense. Sudbrook said long term he thinks the change will be good for the game, but the thrill of a home run can't be replaced. A home run's exciting. You know, a home run is more exciting than a sacrifice bunt. And have you lost a little bit of that entertainment going to a bat that acts like wood, quite possibly. For SBU TV, I'm Kevin Clark. Last season, St. Bonaventure hit 39 home runs, and through 36 games this season, the Bonnies have hit only 15 home runs. At St. Bonaventure, 27 international student athletes take up the rosters in six sports. Leah Murphy found out why they come to the United States. 27 out of 33 international students at St. Bonaventure are athletes. And nine are on the tennis team. One might wonder why so many international athletes come to the United States. Head coach Michael Bates explains why. Tennis is such an international sport played all over the world. It's a little bit easier sometimes to get foreign, foreign players to come here and play here. They, they don't have as many opportunities to play in college. Luis Guevara from Venezuela has played all his life and wanted to do more with tennis. Coming here was the best choice because he could pay for my, uh, my college degree. Mm -hmm. I could learn another language. 
Riley Archer from Ontario was on the fence about playing tennis in college. I didn't know whether I wanted to keep playing tennis or not, so it was kind of if I was going to keep playing, I'd come here because there's only like two or three universities in Canada that have tennis. Guevara and Archer both noticed differences about playing internationally versus playing in the United States. First of all, it's uh, indoor courts. I never played indoor courts before I got here. I think it's, um, it's a team sport here. Like, you try to do as best you can, but at the end, you need the help of your team if you want to win. It's faster paced, more intense, like, harder in every aspect. For SBU TV, I'm Leah Murphy. The men's tennis team finished with 10 wins and 12 losses, while the women finished with 9 wins and 13 losses. The SVU baseball team thought it had a serious setback when it learned that starting pitcher Jordan Crane tore his ACL. They were wrong. Michael Peace from SVU's broadcast reporting class has the story. Pitcher Jordan Crane hurt his knee in January in a pickup basketball game. The news got worse when his MRI revealed a torn ACL. All of a sudden, his junior season was up in the air. As soon as I got hurt and they said it was a torn ACL, I thought I was done for the season and I have to redshirt. And I was kind of bummed and I went and talked to the doctors and they said that I could try a brace. So, what's in my spirits? Despite the injury, Crane has emerged as a top flight starting pitcher for the Bonnies with impressive performances against St. Louis University, Fordham, and Xavier. Crane wears this Donjoy brace on his left knee while pitching. He goes through a specific regiment before and after he throws. So far, the work has been paying off for him. Initially, after he tore the ACL, there was a lot of swelling. So the first steps are we got the fluid out of his knee, which was you know, icing, um, electrical stimulation, um, some compression wraps, um, general range of motion exercises, um, until the swelling was out. Um. With the Bonnie's Atlantic 10 schedule half over, they are on track to make their first A-10 tournament since 2008. If this ends up being the case, Jordan Crane and his left knee will be a big reason why. Yeah, as soon as the season's over, I'm going to have surgery probably within a week or a week and a half after that. And that'll be a six month rehab, so hopefully we'll be ready for next season. For SBU TV, I'm Michael Pease. The Bonnies are scheduled to play past graduation. We'd especially like to thank the students from Broadcast Reporting Class who contributed to stories today. Many of them will be back in the fall with SBU TV. That's all this semester for SVU TV. I'm Kirsty Angieski. And I'm Lauren Adams. For the rest of us here in the Coop Lab, thanks for watching. And now it's time to take a look at what all our seniors have done this year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Forget that Housekeeping Services offers big... Hold on. Again, I want to wear the ball cap, yeah. Even with his experience as a motivational speaker, it took some time for Coach Muchek to get his team... Nope. Nope. That was wrong. Oh, the sun. Oh, okay. I'm going to have to do this a couple times because the sun's like right there isn't the only fun thing to do at Pumpkinville. Should I smile? I feel like I look very serious. I know. <laughs> Even the first two conference series for the Bonnies are away from Fred Handler Park, which could be challenged. You have reached a record high. I messed it up. I was like, drive to a cheap. Do you like me flipping the page? Yeah. Do you think I'm talking okay, like loud enough? Or is it gonna sound too quiet? I can probably- Take two, take two. Cove has my wall playing. Idea of an entertainment. <laughs> All right. How's my hair look? The sixth annual Bonagani. Nope, lost it. <laughs> the sixth annual Bonagani I think A! Okay. Am I still in shot? The sixth annual Bonnet Game. Stand up in three, two.
can't even. Santa. Okay. Beat me. Nah. Beat me. Nah. Beat me. Nah. No. Picking the perfect pumpkin is picking the perfect pump safety hazards on the road. My eyes are watering. Do you think that was okay? Including once more reaching the conference tournament in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Reporting from the newsroom, I'm Tony Jones for SBU TV Sports. Ryan appears on ESPN shows the sports reporters, PTI, and Around the Horn, but doesn't consider himself a TV personality. As e-reader sales continue to thrive, owners realize the future of libraries and bookstores face some uncertainty. Though standardized tests vary from state to state, these tests are a cause of concern all around, even here on the St. Bonaventure campus. There's one simple thing you can do to prevent your car from being broken into. 